Hello and welcome to the Eggplant Performance Tutorial Series. My name is Tom Messer and in these videos I'll be showing you how to run performance tests using Eggplant Performance. The series will begin with an introduction to performance testing and why people do it, after which I will gradually begin introducing the various functionality available in the tool. If you're already familiar with performance testing, then you may want to skip the first couple of minutes of this chapter, as you're more than likely already familiar with things like client-server applications and the implications it has on software performance. However, there is some information about the different automation options available that may still be of interest. If you want to skip ahead, I'd recommend using the links in the descriptions of each tutorial video, as it will give you easy access to the various topics discussed. Without further ado, let's begin with the performance testing primer. So these days, software is, is often deployed in a client-server model, a classic example being a website that you may visit through your browser. The following is an example of what a typical client-server setup looks like. Bob here is the client. He wants to search for something on Google. When Bob types in the URL to Google in his browser's address bar, an HTTP request is made. That HTTP request is picked up by a server that Google operates and maintains. In reality, there's actually many, many more servers involved, but for the sake of this example, let's keep it simple and assume there is just a single server. As a result of the request, that server has to do some thinking before it can send a response back to Bob. Once that thinking is complete, Bob will see that Google homepage in his browser. The important bit to understand is that the server thinking is synonymous with it using some computing resources in order to service the request. In reality, there will be lots and lots of people just like Bob trying to load up Google too. That's going to make the server think pretty hard, and eventually it will simply not have enough hardware resources available to service all of the incoming requests in a reasonable amount of time. And we all know what happens when something takes too long, right? People start becoming quite unhappy. Fortunately, Google knows that, and so they go through some lengths to ensure optimal performance for all of its users. So, how do you simulate lots of users like this? Well, first of all, Bob needs some specialist tools like Eggplant Performance. With it, Bob can employ virtual users, which can design to mimic the activities of real users. With a tool like Eggplant Performance, Bob can quickly and easily run lots of performance tests that will provide him with performance statistics from which he can make statements about how the software he is testing is performing. Armed with this data, Bob can put it in front of the development team and get them to check out how they could potentially make improvements to the software. More importantly, when changes are made, he can then go back to Eggplant Performance and run exactly the same test as before the changes were made, to then be able to say whether or not there were any performance improvements. This is the essence of what performance testing aims to achieve. Expose performance problems by running a series of performance tests, optimize server-side code, rerun the tests to ensure the changes resulted in positive outcomes, and compile a report of all the findings when the testing concludes. Performance testing is critical to a good user experience. Fast software leads to more productive and engaged users, which eventually leads to happiness all around. So how do you get started with performance testing? Well, one of the first things you'll need to do is work out which automation technique would be the most suitable for the application or system you're trying to test. These different techniques manifest as different virtual user types in Eggplant Performance. Here is a list of available VU types, along with which scripting language they support, and some high-level features. Let's start off with the web virtual user, which is also known as the standard VU, where you have a choice of scripting in C-sharp or Java. So the web VU is the go-to choice for testing web content, which basically translates to anything that communicates over HTTP. The obvious example here is, of course, websites, but it can also apply to rich client applications and mobile apps. The WebVU is the most feature-rich of the available VU types, primarily as a result of there being a script recorder and powerful generation rule functionality. We'll be going into more detail on what exactly that means in subsequent chapters. Next up is the Selenium VU, where the scripting is performed in Java. So the Selenium VU is also used to test web content. However, instead of simply sending and receiving HTTP requests and responses, Selenium sits at a slightly higher level, automating an actual browser. 
This means that it is able to give you more of an end-to-end -end response time uh, compared to the web virtual user because the Selenium VU also executes client-side JavaScript. If you are testing a JavaScript heavy site and need visibility of the response time as far as an end user is concerned, Selenium would be the way to go. However, the requirement for there to be an actual browser per VU does mean that each Selenium VU requires more processing power and memory than the equivalent web virtual user. Next up is a Citrix VU where the scripts are written in C sharp. The Citrix VU is for use in environments featuring Citrix. Uh, and in case you didn't know, Citrix is a technology, much like RDP for Windows or the more generic VNC protocol. Uh, it allows you to see the screen of a remote system. And this remote system is where all of your applications are installed, rather than those applications being installed locally, which in large corporations can become difficult to manage. The Citrix VU features a recorder that captures all interactions made with the remote system and primarily uses image matching as a means of synchronizing the VU. Next is the Eggplant Functional VU where scripts are written in SenseTalk. So the Eggplant Functional VU allows you to write SenseTalk in Eggplant Functional that can then be run multiple times simultaneously through Eggplant Performance. This allows you to reuse scripts created for functional testing purposes and gives the most accurate end-to-end -end response time as you would be interacting with the very same screen or UI as a real user would be. Another benefit is the ability to performance test almost any system as long as it supports either VNC or RDP. This is quite important because many applications use proprietary protocols that one simply cannot simulate at the protocol level, meaning one has no choice but to interact with the application at the same level as the user. However, the drawback of automating at the UI layer is that each VU needs its own system to connect into, meaning scalability, in other words the number of VUs you can run on available hardware, can become an issue. As a result, what we often see is hybrid tests featuring lower level, lower overhead web VUs simulating the majority of the load, combined them with a handful of eggplant functional VUs capturing that end-to-end -end response time. Next up is WinDriver, and the scripts there are written in C Sharp. So the alternative to the image-based approach employed by both the Citrix and eggplant functional VUs is the object-based approach. And this means interacting with elements that an application exposes to external processes. These elements can be anything from buttons to text fields to menu items. As long as those elements are available, one can send keyboard and mouse commands to them, as well as waiting for new elements to appear as a result of those actions. The WinDriver VU also has the image-based approach as a fallback mechanism for when elements are not exposed by an application. As the WinDriver VU also operates at the UI layer, each VU will again need its own session to connect into, which can make acquisition of sufficient hardware difficult if simulating high VU concurrency. Last we have the TCP IP virtual user, where scripts are written in C++. The TCP IP VU is more advanced as a result of operating at the network card layer, where data is often encrypted and challenging to work with. Chances are you won't ever need to use it, and even if you do, TestPlant will often be there to assist you with it. Before we conclude this first chapter in the tutorial series, I just wanted to point out that we recently introduced a free edition license. So this license enables the web, Selenium, Citrix and Eggplant functional VUs, with the only restriction being the number of concurrent virtual users you can run in a given test. So the license is perfect for exploring the tool and following along with this tutorial series. Simply head on over to the link displayed on the slide and you'll be up and running in no time. Thanks for watching everyone. In the next chapter I'll be introducing the application that will be the subject of my performance testing during the tutorials, as well as talking about the importance of planning your tests. The chapter after that is where we'll start looking at the tool itself. Hope to see you again soon. Bye bye.